Priority. <laughs> <laughs> I really thought there was nothing more romantic than underactuated robotics. That's what I think so too. <laughs> I didn't think so. Nick, how did these get closed again? I don't know. I think when you pull down the screen, they automatically They automatically closed, yeah. Oh. 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 How did you know my name? Because we talked, right? Yeah. Like that ago, right? I was really hoping you wouldn't remember that. <laughs> I, I remember. Um, everybody can still see that, fine, right? And we're not going to use it. Right? Okay, well, let's uh, get started. <clears throat> Welcome back, happy Valentine's Day. Uh, I actually, I want to say, uh, I read all the surveys that you guys submitted. Some of you didn't submit the surveys or, or even send emails right after uh, saying, oh, here's my survey, I forgot to submit it. If you still have a survey and you haven't put in, please send it, because I really enjoy reading those. And you guys are, a very interesting, diverse class. I mean, so people want snake robots and underwater robots and low, you know, thrust satellites and uh, manipulation and humanoids. Actually, we'll cover sort of a lot of that. But if we don't cover it, I apologize. But I, I actually really like seeing the diversity of interests that you all have, um, and in general, getting a sense for how you feel the pace is going and everything. That's really helpful for me. Uh, at least one of you got your feet wet walking home in the snow on Tuesday, and I'm sorry about that. That was, uh, but oh, it's very good. So I appreciate the feedback. Um, okay, so let's dig in. Last time we we introduced the notion of using optimization to design controllers, and that's a theme we're going to carry on for a long time. But I swept a lot of the details under the rug last time by making a very discreet. Sorry, <laughs> I guess I, I'm gonna I'm gonna call uh, call my yeah just give up on that one. Okay, we had this idea that we'd have the window shades open, but periodically they close themselves, and I I don't know how to turn that off. Okay, so last time we started talking about optimal control, we used our simple example, which was the double integrator with saturations. Right, which had a beautiful solution where the optimal controller was this bang-bang solution, which we could plot in state space, where a lot of the state space, I actually do have my pillow. Where there was this key trajectory when u equals minus 1, and that actually that's the best thing you can do all the way over here is just to apply u equals minus 1, right? And then 
this key trajectory where u equals positive one, and that's the best thing you can do over here. And so we were able to, just using intuition, really, uh, discover what we were pretty sure was the optimal policy. We didn't prove it yet, okay, but uh, felt pretty good. Uh, and then we made our first algorithm, which was an approximation of this, where we tiled the state space with discrete states. We put a transitions between those states whenever you could go from, with some control action, the state could go from here to one of these other states. And then we did graph search to try to find the same solution. And in fact, we had the algorithm running and popping up with plots that looked pretty much like this. Right? So that was a, a first pass, a very coarse pass at how to start solving the optimal control problems if you have discrete states, discrete actions, right? And in particular, um, you know, for that problem, we, I, we said there was a one-step cost function, which for that particular problem, we said the cost was one if the state was not equal to the goal, zero, zero. And it was zero if S equals the goal. We were able to take our continuous dynamics and approximate it on the graph with this discrete dynamics, which told me it was still a function that took my state and an action and mapped me to the next state, but now this was a discrete in time, in state, and in action. <clears throat> and we wrote down this very important equation, which says for all um, SI, Right, this was our dynamic programming recursion, which took advantage of the fact that we had an additive cost. Our total cost being, our total goal being to minimize over the long term the sum of these And the first thing I wanted to emphasize there was this is just a condition which certifies optimality. So if you give me a controller, and if you can give me, if you want to prove to me that that controller is optimal, then what you should also do is give me this cost to go function that you've got by whatever means necessary. I'll verify that your cost to go function, that first of all your policy had better be consistent with that cost to go function. So it must be the minimizing A here. And that when I stick in that minimizing A, I better get out this consistency equation. It turned out this, al this also gave us an algorithm. We, we applied it, this is like an update, but the first thing we had really was just a check, which says um, if you give me uh, a pi, then the way to convince me that it's optimal is to give me this j to go along with it. Okay. So today I want to um, I want to lift some of the assumptions that we did. You know this. I said this is a graph, but I also said ah, you don't actually ever land in, you know, for, for most U's, you're not going to land exactly in one of the other nodes. And I, we swept some of the details under the, under the rug. So 
let's try to remove those details, okay? Or uncover those details. <coughs> And um, you know, here's the map. In the screen, we said we have, you know, S n plus one is f of S n. A n is our dynamics. I'm going to write a little subscript d here just so that we know that these functions need not be the same. And today we're going to get back to the continuous where x dot equals f of c, x, u. Our cost function over here was we were minimizing some long-term cost. Like this. And you won't be too surprised to see that our, our formulation today is going to be to minimize a continuous thing, you know, over some integral, right? And the same way we had this before, this condition for optimality, I'll put a little subscript D here just to make sure that those costs need not be the same either. And we're going to come up with the continuous time equivalent. And this one might surprise you if you haven't seen it. Um, it looks a little different. Not a lot different, but just a little different. Okay, so our goal is going to go from here to here. This is a super famous equation. It's called the Hamilton Jacobi. Elman equation. Some people call it the Hamilton Bellman Jacobi equation or whatever, but you know, Bellman was from just the last century. These guys are pretty old, so I think they deserve to go first. Um, and if you look at the, the structure of this equation, this was a relationship which says would, it's a, cell, a consistency condition on J saying that somehow j has to be consistent with its neighbors through these kind of update rules on the graph. And similarly, this is a partial differential equation that's telling me something about how j has to behave over x. So in order to satisfy this, I have to come up with some j which is for which its derivatives satisfy this equation. Right? It's a partial differential equation. Partial differential equation. Okay, so if I do this badly, you're going to just be annoyed at the algebra. But if I do this right, you don't have to tell me at the end which one it is, but uh, if I do this right, I actually think that there's more clarity, more intuition, at least for me, in the continuous time version. You can see some structure of the equations that I think are just not easy to see here at all. Okay, so if you get bogged down in the algebra, you know, do something that makes me know you're irritated, and I'll try to make sure I lift up and make sure you're seeing that structure. <clears throat> okay. Let me go over here. So how are we going to go from, from there to there? Um, in particular, where did this thing come from? And I, I just, I'll, I'll just give the sort of informal derivation, but I 
I think uh, it, there's a, a more careful version of the informal derivation in the notes, and there's a link to various more formal definitions uh, that are available out there. But I, I really want to drive your intuition more than the detailed equations. Okay, so first of all, um, in the math, in the equations that we can write on the board, going from discrete states and discrete actions are actually not that big of a deal at all. Uh, they're going to change the numerical implementation a lot. Okay, but just as far, as far as equations on the board, if I wanted to replace S, which I think of as, as living in a discrete set, with an X, a continuous, I can still write the dynamics looking almost exactly the same. So that's, that's not a big deal. Same with the uh, actions. So, so really, the first step is just uh, notational, really, which is that I'm going to have a continuous state space now and think of it as being updated in discrete time. That's our sort of stepping stone. Okay. And we'll say, I'd like to minimize this long term again. And then for this, this equation stays intact. J star is just min over u. G of x u plus J star f of x u, right? Changing this into a continuous variable doesn't, didn't affect any of those equations whatsoever. If you think about how do I search over u, in the discrete case, I could just try all of the u's and take the, the, the one that gave me the minimum value. In the continuous case, I'm going to have to do something smarter here, and we'll look into that, the various cases that you can solve for that in a few minutes. The bigger step here is going from xn to xt. Okay? And I'm going to do that by roughly using this Kind of a notation of basically going from xn plus 1 to thinking about xt plus some dt, right? Some small time step. And then taking a limit. A limit as dt goes to 0. And what you'll see is that that turns this equation into my famous PD equation. Okay? So let's just do it in a couple steps. I, I always try to decide how much I should jump over here, but let me just, I can do it in a few steps here. So J star of X, um, let's write it. I can already take, if, I, if, I, if this is suddenly an integral, I can already break this up into something that looks like this by saying, let me say it's the integral over some small dt. I'll use a different integration variable here of my, one, of my instantaneous cost. Okay, plus the cost that I'm going to get after having survived that small transition. Is that fair? I'll integrate just from 0 to dt, and then this captures the cost to go from, from dt onto the rest. Okay. Do you capture both of those, right? Uh, no. Good. And uh, okay, I still need a, but I do do have a min over u that's in here somewhere. And the, the min over u is still defined as a a, a long term u. Okay. Now, how do I ex how do I write this? So, um, how am I going to expand that? So. In the limit of small dt, I can simplify these. Okay, so when this thing is small, then it's correct to approximate it with this in the limit, right? 
So it's going to be min over u. Sorry, not writing that. Okay. And then this thing, I can also take in the limit of small dt to be dj dt times dt. Okay. What is dj dt? j, we've said, is only a function of x. So its only dependence on time is via x. x dot, which is f of x u. Okay, and it'll be times dt still. Okay, so the terms are starting to appear here. Right, I still got this limiting thing here and a dt hanging around. <clears throat> I'm sorry, geez, you guys got to catch me on this. I got, I forgot my j of x star plus this. It's a first order expansion. Okay, now it's just a little bit of um, algebra. So first of all. This j of x, just j star, the fact that this j star appeared in the middle of this, this doesn't actually depend on u nor on dt. You can pull that all the way out. Okay? So sort of this, this expansion, it's natural if you think about it as this first order Taylor expansion, but it kills this term actually. So this term actually cancels and I get zero, zero equals limit dt goes to zero, min over u dx u dt plus, let me just go ahead and write it in like this, partial j, partial x, f of x u dt. And it turns out that you can pull the dt out. It has to be, if this thing is at the limit of dt goes to zero, for any dt, the thing inside there has to be zero. So I'm left with the equation I want. Now I'm going to use an example, examples and pictures to make that really clear. But from the algebra, calculus, you know, we're, we're going to, we're just taking the limit, the limiting behavior of that, of this equation that we already knew and loved, and we, and it turns out to be a property of the gradient. Let me try to convince you that it makes sense. Did everything look okay? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. No problem. How do you uh, the line that you have using the, the implied sign to go up from j uh, di j star di x f of x u? Uh, why 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 not fully expand it out with the di j star di u term? Is that just me being bad at calculus? Um, it's fine. So so I have a function of only x here. Okay. So the, by the chain rule, the gradient, the dependence on c on this on time oh, is partial j, partial x. There's no explicit oh, okay. dependence on u here. Thanks. Yeah. Let me try to convince you that this makes sense. Okay. So um, if I were to take the min over u and put this in, then this says that g x u star. Let me call it has to equal the, the, it's the opposite of this has to equal partial j partial x star f of x u. Right, that's just, this is u star. If I, could, if I figure out what the optimal u is, stick it in here, right? It's equal to zero, I'm just going to move this to the other side. This thing, remember, is just j dj dt. This is the speed at which I'm going downhill and my cost to go. So what does this say? This whole equation, which looks maybe unfamiliar, all it's saying is that my cost to go has to be changing over time at the same rate I'm accruing cost. That's all it's saying. That as I'm going, I better be going downhill. My, 
you know, I'm, there's some function j which is keeping track of how much cost I expect to occur for the rest of time. That function had better be going down at the rate that I'm accumulating cost. Okay, so that's that's really it. That's the sum total of it. And actually, any u we we saw this in the grid world, right? Right, if we had the goal here and then we got ones everywhere, right, and then we figured out we had twos everywhere on the next pass, okay. All it was saying was that I can take any action that's going to go down, okay, but my cost to go here has to be equal to the one step cost of going across here. That was the discrete equivalent. This is just the continuous version of it. At every instant in time, my cost to go, as I'm moving forward, is going down at the same rate that my cost function would be if I was going the other way. Because that cost is now in my past, I'm not, I won't accrue it anymore. It's not the cost to go. It's moving terms from the cost, total cost to the cost to go. So you also need, and this is, this is a differential equation, you also need some sort of, if you want a, a partial differential equation, you also need some sort of boundary condition, right? If you think of it as a PDE that I'm trying to solve, so for instance, you could say J at X equals zero is zero or something like this. And this was a question that you guys asked last time, and I'm sorry that I, I uh, brushed it off too quickly, but the, even the discrete time value iteration, it converges, but only up to a constant factor. So it is it, it, similarly, um, if you started this thing with cost of 100 and then started running the value iteration, it would still have that cost of 100 for all time. All right, so I, I said that too quickly last time. But then it's exactly the same reason that this is a PDE here, which is just a consistency condition across neighboring states, effectively. But you could lift that whole solution up or down, still get the same controller out, okay? And, uh, and the recursion only tells you about the, the relative differences. So don't get lost in this part. This is just in case you want to see where it came from. This is what I want you to understand. There's a, you know, when I'm taking the best action, I'm going downhill at the rate I'm occurring cost. Yeah? So your goal, in order to find an optimal controller, is to find this cost to go, right? And then just, you can just run downhill. It'll tell you what your policy is. Cool, okay, so um, let's do an example to make it more, I want, well, both to, to make it more concrete, but also to, uh, to practice some of the machinery. I, again, I appreciated some of the feedback you guys gave in the survey, so I'll do a little bit more uh, you know, examples and machinery uh, when I can. Well, okay, so to be fair, some people wanted more math, some people wanted less math, some people wanted more examples. I guess nobody wanted less examples, uh, but uh, um, yeah, it's a, it's a hard game to optimize, but I'll do my best. All right, so let's, let's work through an example. Um, let's say I have my same double integrator. And this time, let's say my cost function, my instantaneous cost function, is where x, remember, is just I mean, q, q dot for this system, right? It's a second order system. So let's say my cost function is just, um, let's say, q squared plus q dot squared plus u squared. I would like to convince you that the following controller is optimal. Let me make sure I write it down right here. Okay. This is a this is a sufficiency theorem. This is a well. This is a uh, a consistency check, right? So it's not yet an algorithm for finding controllers. This is just 
you know, what we have so far is I have a controller, I believe it's optimal, and I'm going to try to convince you. Okay? This is the controller I believe is optimal. Here's how I'm going to try to convince you. Take a look at this J. And my claim is that this is the proof. Here's my certificate. Okay? This proves that this controller is optimal for that cost function of that dynamic. Right now I'm just pulling it out of a hat. I'll show you where it came from later. But let's just make sure we understand how we how we would check it. Okay? And and even just make sure that we are comfortable with the mechanics of it. <clears throat> so first of all, what is the um, you now, what is dj dt here? Right, I wrote it in vector form there. I don't want that to confuse you, but so if I take the partial here, partial j, partial l, it's, it's definitely partial j, partial x, f of x, u. Still, okay, nothing's changed there, but, but I could also write it, if I write it element wise, it's partial j, partial q, q dot plus partial j, partial q dot, q double dot, which is u, okay? Just to make sure you guys see that this is the same thing, right? Hi, Mary D. Come I'm on in, yeah, <laughs> that's great. Um, Crystal? Crystal? Yes. <laughs> I wondered if I'd get through the lecture. Anybody watches that later? That was not me singing. <laughs> it would have sounded similar, but uh... okay. So um, let's just make sure that this computes, right? So when I use this notation, j is a scalar, x is a vector. So when I write a partial derivative, partial of a scalar with respect to a vector, it's going to be partial j, partial x1. Partial j, partial x2, right? Which in this case would be q and q dot, right? Times what's f of x is just q dot, q double dot, right? So these are exactly the same thing. And always partial derivatives for me, you're going to take the, the, if this is a vector, you'd have a bit row-wise, and this goes along the columns, okay? 
So what's um, partial J partial Q here? Is just two square root of three Q plus two Q dot. Okay. Partial J partial Q dot is uh, almost the same, but it's 2Q plus 2 square root of 3 Q dot. So, you know, altogether I have this sufficiency condition, which better work out if I'm doing everything right here. Q squared plus Q dot squared plus U squared plus this, which is partial J partial Q, Q dot plus partial J partial Q dot, Q double dot, which is just U. Okay? For you to believe my proof, there's two things that have to happen. First of all, U star had better be the minimizing U here. And second of all, when I put that minimizing u in, it had better given give me this. This this had better uh, equal zero, right? You understand the mechanics of it, right? Okay. So how do I minimize over u? This is now a continuous optimization. It's a particularly easy one, which is why I like it as a first example here, because u enters in. It's a quadratic dependence on u. And in fact, it's a positive quadratic dependence on you, right? So this is some function. I don't know exactly what it is. Well, it depends on all these other variables. But as I, I know it looks like that somewhere, right? It's got a, right? So this is my uh, my total term in terms of u. It's like everything inside that parentheses, right? And so the minimizing u, I can find by just taking the gradient. Where, it goes, where the gradient vanishes, okay? So if I take the gradient of, can I just say the gradient of everything inside that bracket there with respect to u? Well, that's easy. That's just 2u plus, I'll go ahead and substitute this in, but um, 2q dot, well, let me write it out. So. Okay. If I set this thing equal to zero, I find that u star, the minimizing u for this, is exactly when u equals negative q minus square root of three q dot. Which I'm pretty sure, yeah, that's what I wrote over here. Is that level of, of working it out useful? Yeah? Okay, so given someone told me this J that I believe I'm following, this all this is saying, this is the fastest way to go downhill on that. Right? Now I need to confirm that it's consistent, that if I go downhill at that rate, I in fact accrue cost at the rate that I'm going downhill. That's the second check, okay? And I won't write that one all the way out, but um, if I were to just stick this U back in, plus this, so negative q squared squared plus times uh, u, which is then this whole thing again. then this thing had better equal zero. And I promise you, all the terms cancel. If you want to do a quick check, then for instance, let's just look at all of the Q squared terms. Q squared, I get Q squared, I get a 
plus q squared. I must get a minus 2q squared over here. All right, so that one vanishes. The same thing will happen for q dot squared. I'll get a minus. I get actually probably six of them or something that will cross out. Okay, but those, those are all going to cancel. Okay, so I hope you will accept my, that this was a certificate for optimality of that controller. And that's the recipe we have so far. Um, you know, you should, you have a right to be sort of annoyed that I pulled that out of my hat so far, but we'll do, we'll do a little better here. Uh, <clears throat> I want to draw it. I want to make sure you connect to it, not algebraically, but somehow more intuitively. So um, I'm going to keep it in 2D, but um, can I first just draw, let's draw G of XU. Can I, can I draw the level sets of, of G? It's a function, right, that comes out of the board, but let me just draw the level sets. That's, G is just, um, let's even set U equal to zero, okay? G is just a quadratic function, which means that it's a bowl coming out of the board here, right? That are perfect circles. These are the level sets of G, X, let's say zero equals some constant. Right, and they're getting bigger as they come out. Yeah, quadratic function. What does the cost to go look like? Draw some level sets of the cost to go. What does that look like? Uh, the way I think about it, you could you might have different ways to, for plotting it, but um, I'd like to write that into a into the quadratic form that it is. So I, I see that as. The matrix form is easier for me to think about plotting. Okay, so that's again a quadratic function, a quad of some bowl, but now it's not symmetric. This one was just symmetric around the origin. It's somehow elongated. Uh, you can figure, you can plot that if you want to take the eigenvectors and eigenvalues, for instance. The eigenvectors of this are going to be 1, 1, and 1, negative 1. And the eigenvalues would be square root of 3 plus or minus 1. Actually, yeah, it's plus one on this one. Yeah. Okay. So if I want to plot that, that means that I'm going to draw the 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 ellipses are going to look are going to live on sort of the major and minor axes of, of the ellipse are going to be on these eigenvectors. You know, I mean, I hope this is okay, but you can also just ask Python to plot it for you. But. Okay, and then the steeper one, the one with a higher eigenvalue, is going to be, go up steeper, which means it's going to be elongated in the other direction, right? So it's going to be, this will be a level set. This is the positive, this, this, the higher eigenvalue. They're both positive. So it's a bowl coming out. And really, that's what optimal control is doing. 
is it's taking my, this is sort of a, well, in fact, it's even, in our case, it's just x transpose x. This is my one step cost. And it's transforming it into the long term cost, right? I'll write x transpose sx, which is my sort of long-term cost. And the way it does that is it, it factors in the dynamics. And that's the pictures I've tried to, to, to give you when we watched even the grid world evolve over time, is that it would sort of figure out backwards in time how long it would take to get to the goal. And in the pendulum, even, it would try to back out and sort of ooze the dynamics backwards in time. And so just like in that pendulum example, this has taken this one step cost, and if I stretch it over time, it goes out like this. Why does it do that? Because you know we have vector fields that are going this way. The system wants to be able to go in like this. I, we're not doing the, the bang bang controller anymore, but still that's relevant, is that you know that if you're up here, you're sort of closer to the goal than if you're up here, right? Because this one, I can let the dynamics drive me in, ride my, myself in towards the goal, whereas this one, I have to fight the dynamics and go all the way around in order to come in. So it's discovered this sort of long-term property by just having to make that HJB equation consistent. The PDE solution figures that out. And in fact, if you were to have um, a finite time version of this, if we were to somehow make this a finite time, or the integral version also, then the cost to go suddenly depends on time. And it will actually just you know, watch it morph out. As you, know, as, as you go backwards in time, you have more and more of the dynamics coming into play. Very beautiful, I think. And do you remember this being the solution that we the had we had coming out of the the Python version too? Yeah. Uh, is this unique? Is it unique? Yes. This this solution, this particular J star U star, it solves this equation. Uh, I could always add a constant to it, just like the the discrete time case. Uh, but otherwise, J is unique. The level sets are unique. The level sets are unique. Yeah. The policy. In this case, actually, is even unique, but in general, you don't have that. Here's the value iteration algorithm, right? That we solved for. Okay. It's that same the same level set. That's the picture I was trying to draw on the board. Okay. It's actually tilted a little bit here. It's not actually elongated along the ones, and that's the numerical errors coming in. And we'll ask you to explore that a little bit. Frustrating. It's hard to get rid of in a in a satisfying way. Okay. There's also this the stuff that rolls up at the edge here. Like I said, is some edge effects um, because I run out of u and I run out of x in my discrete approximation. But in the the middle where there's no weird edge effects, it's really finding that quadratic form. Okay. Just. While I've got a simple example here, let's just think about other times where I might be able to solve for u. Okay, so uh, first of all, it's interesting that, that my original double integrator, I put a saturation on u. I didn't put one in here, right? <clears throat> because there's a reasonable u. By putting a cost on u, it encourages me to pick some finite u. If I didn't have this term, then what would be the minimizing u? If suddenly I was just linear in u, 
then that would tell me use infinite u to accomplish the task, right? Put as put just you know u is infinity. It's either positive infinity or negative infinity, depending on what the sign of that is. Okay. So typically, and, and that would be okay, that's still a reasonable optimization if I said, if I put those constraints back on, that I would say minimize u, um, you know, inside something, then it would be not the, you know, it would be, it would be saturated at one. And the same equation, if I come up with the j and I ask for this to satisfy, the minimizer is just going to be at one of the constraints. Because you know that this will go smaller and smaller as I drive you until I hit my limit. Is that fair? So I, I've now, by writing that, screwed up this equation. Let me just repair it. But, okay. And we'll see that again. Those are, those are the two most common cases. One is you, you ten, tend to either need saturations or you need cost on you. Uh, either one can do the job. You can have both, but uh, typically it's one or the other to make sure that you're you're asking a reasonable question as a finite answer. Now, in fact, you can um, you can do all this for the bang bang controller. I chose not to just for a, a subtle reason, but let me um, let me show you what why that is. So. In the notes, actually, I have the, um, you know, not only the bang bang controller, but also I went through and just computed. It's kind of a little bit ugly, the cost to go that you'd expect by running the bang bang controller. Okay, and it's plotted like this. Okay, so if you take that cost to go and you put your controller in and run it through the equations, everything's great, everything checks. Okay, but. There's a subtlety, which is that the, the cost to go function is actually not completely differentiable. There's a ridge here, right at, right at, that, um, right at the place where there's a switching surface. If I'm on one side of that, I, I go up. I go up. The other side, I also go up. And it comes into a little valley, OK? So everything holds, but my sufficiency theorem said it was a condition on the partial derivatives. And so the technical conditions for this say that it's only, it only, the sufficiency theorem only holds, is only guaranteed to prove optimality if this is defined everywhere. And there's this measure zero set of where, where I don't even actually have a good answer for that. And you can be careful about that and get around it. But that's the only reason I didn't choose to do that. Otherwise, uh, you can run through the exact same argument with the bang bang controller and everything checks wherever this exists, okay? Um, so that's suggestive that we're that we're optimal, but not yet conclusive. We'll do one. We'll have one more piece of machinery in to to get around that later. Good. Yes. Yeah, uh, so if you define it using, let's say, one-sided directional derivatives, that, and that would deal with that. That deal with like, a lot of scenarios. Um, you got to be careful. Um, I mean, the, the the theorems that I know and love and trust are only proven for the fully continuous case, and I think you get into a case by case basis if you start going that way. That is the route forward, I think, to to repair it. Or, the, but the, the actually the route we'll go through is to to talk about optimality along any particular path, and if it's if for all paths, because no orbit of the optimal controller actually crosses that singularity. So the sort of fundamental reason, way to get around it is to forget, the, stop trying to sweep across X and to look along paths of the, of the solution. Uh, I don't deny that, that you could be careful and get through those uh, by looking over X too, but I haven't done it. Okay. So um, let me tell you where this came from. Um, it's a very special case. I didn't just pull it out of a hat. It's one of the only cases where 
you can solve for the optimal controller at least numerically. But it's a really good case. It's going to give, give us a lot of mileage. And that it was a special example of the linear quadratic regulator. equals AX plus BU is our more general form of that. Right for the double integrator I just had X dot equals 0, 1, 0, 0, X plus And the more general form of the cost that I can solve these for is any sort of quadratic form on x and u. But for sure, because I'm going to do the same trick of trying to be positive quadratic in u, I'd like that r, it's going to be easier to symmetric, and it's positive definite. So if, in general, as R becomes a matrix, if you use a scalar for this one, but in general, it works if you use a, a vector. And so the positive R generalizes to being a positive definite matrix, and a symmetric positive definite matrix. I'd like my cost in X to go to zero nicely, too. So you could have, have it um, better to be at infinity, but probably not when you want to run on a robot. So let's say that Q is also, I'll make it symmetric, and you could choose it to be zero, actually. That one isn't as important. But let's not make it optimal to be at infinity. So we'll make it positive definite. Okay? Positive definite or positive semi-definite? So this one is allowed to be semi-definite, and this one it has to be positive definite. Otherwise, if this was zero, then we have the problem of infinite U being okay. Okay? And I guess you see that you know that, that form I did before, the example I had before, I had Q is just the identity and R equals one. And then it's exactly the example I did before. Now here's a you know it's kind of annoying or whatever, but let me just tell you, you would be wise to guess J of X having a quadratic form like this. And there's deep reasons why that's the right answer. But it's enough for me to, to say, if you search over this, we'll show that it's, we can always find an S that is, satisfies the sufficiency theorem for optimality, okay? And in general, I, I also want S to be positive. And symmetric, okay? Um, there's a skill that you'll acquire if you don't have it yet of taking gradients of matrix equations of quadratic forms. Um, remember I said this is a if this is a scalar and this is a vector then I should get a row vector out. It's, it's almost what you'd expect. This is just x squared, right? So I should get something like sx. Maybe 2sx, right? Because it's a but um, I want the, the row vector, so it's going to be 2x transpose s is going to be my, my gradient. Okay. If you do a couple of them, you'll, you'll agree. So I've reduced this down to it 
it's the matrix version of it, but it's the same thing, right? I've got a positive quadratic function in U. It's got a linear term in U, okay? So I can find the minimum by taking the gradient of that whole thing with respect to U. I get two U transpose R plus two X transpose S B. <coughs> if I set this equal to zero, then I can pull this to the other side multiply R inverse, and then I can also take the tra transpose out, just so I, I think about it as a my standard form here. This is always coming out to be linear in X. So it's often just written like that. If I substitute this thing back in here, so first of all, I was able to, given a quadratic function, I'm able to figure out how to go downhill on it. That's not too surprising. It's nice that it's linear, okay? But the fact that I could solve that isn't so shocking, maybe. When I drop this back in, there's going to be one particular solution for S. There had better be one particular solution for S, which makes this whole thing equal to zero. Okay? And that one, I won't write the algebra because I think it would just distract more than it would help. But if, I, if you put all the terms back in and remove the, the X's from the side, you get the following condition. Oops. You get you have you get this for all x and for all u, but this it, it it turns out this has to be true for for the matrices. Okay. If I find an s that satisfies this equation. Then I pop it in here with this, and I get zero on the other side. Yeah? Is that R inverse? It is R inverse. You want to write it bigger? Now, if you look at that equation, you should probably think, uh, okay, I don't know how to solve that for S, right? That's still a hard thing to solve for S. It's got S coming in in this quadratic way, um, but you know, not in a way that's sort of easy to solve. Luckily, it's an important enough equation that very smart people have spent a lot of time figuring out good ways to solve it, okay? We know about it. This is called the pair for often. Continuous algebraic Riccati oops, I always do that equation care and if you ask MATLAB to solve the care then uh, it will tell you what S is I, there's, it's, it's a numerical recipe for solving it and similarly if you um, you ask, uh, in Python, we wrote it in, into Drake, so there's a function which is linear quadratic regulator, which takes this and will spit out. If you give it A, B, Q, R, which is a slightly more general form, which has N in your cost function too, but you can set N to zero, that's fine. Then it will return U equals negative KX and S. Just a numerical recipe, okay? So it's almost as good as having a closed form solution. It's a numerical, you know, it's a numer arbitrary numerical accuracy.
Okay, so this is LQR, is that you know, intuitively, if you give me A, B, Q, and R, it'll either turn out, it'll turn out K and S, or it'll complain to you if you gave it an R that wasn't positive definite, for instance. Right? It'll actually also fail if the system's not controllable. Let's squawk actually like that. We should update the documentation. Okay, so again, I don't want you to get lost in the algebra. What I want you to see is actually this is better than anything we did in the discrete case. This is, gives you the geometry of the solution. And it really, it's the heart and soul of optimal control and the relationship between cost to go functions and policies and everything like this, okay? So let's, let's think about what that means sort of intuitively. U star equals negative R inverse E transpose SX. This SX, remember that's just, um, that's basically partial j, I mean up to a scaling of a factor of two, that's partial j, partial x. That's the way I want you to think about this. So this controller says, um, it's a negative there, right? So this, this part of it is saying go downhill. Okay, but I have to modulate it by B. I can't go, you know, in directions where I have no actuators. So I'm going to go down, I'm going to take that straight downhill term and twist it by B, my control authority, right? And then I'm going to modulate it again by R because R told me my preference for should I burn a little faster on this actuator or this actuator, right? If I put a different cost on different components of R, that just gives, takes into account preference, right? The limiting case is almost always going to be bang bang, so it's going to be just like our, um, you know, it's it's going to be positive U saturation or negative U saturation. In the multi-dimensional case, it becomes a little bit more complicated, but basically, it's going to turn out to be that the, the gain in front of your linear term tells you what sign those things should be. Um, it's still trying to go downhill, and it's just going to go downhill as fast as possible where the the gain is based on uh, whether u takes me downhill or uphill. So, sorry, the, the sign is times me. Hello again. Do you one more? Do it. Okay. All right. Tony Stewart. Tony Stewart. Tony Stewart. Tony Stewart. Uh oh. All right, bye. <laughs> Tony, you're busted, man. <laughs> Okay, so LQR only works for linear systems, but we're gonna find out that you're gonna get mileage, and we'll, we'll convince you this more in the next couple of lectures, but uh, lots and lots of mileage of approximating nonlinear systems locally as linear systems. Up to and including, maybe as an extreme example, um, for fun, we took, so you know this Atlas robot we have, which you guys are welcome to come see in the lab at some point if you want, although its pump is broken right now. This was the robot that we did a big DARPA competition 
to try to make it drive around and, and do things. It's a full-on humanoid robot. The newer version is the one that does backflips. We have the older 400-pound version of it. it. Could never do a backflip. In fact, it couldn't even get up when it fell down because its backpack had all its batteries in, in there and it was too heavy. We spent a long time saying, okay, what's the optimal strategy for getting up? And then we realized it's like a turtle. You can't get up when it's, I'm afraid it's falling down. It's impossible. Uh, I had a guy who, who's a CrossFit coach trying to figure out if he could kip it up and uh, even that didn't work. Okay, but you take that humanoid robot, you balance it on one toe, you linearize the dynamics, okay, and you call LQR, you run that controller on the robot, this is just a simulation of course, and it's actually pretty good. It's gonna be, sorry, so the simulation is perturbed to random initial conditions, or actually there's some force that hits the robot every uh, periodic interval there, and then it tries to recover, and it's just running the LQR controller, okay? Now that's, you know, I, we didn't run that on the real robot, but, uh, but it's actually surprisingly good. Uh, <clears throat> one of the reasons we didn't run that on the real robot is because there's a critical assumption that makes this work, and we'll see it more as we get into walking robots. Um, the dynamics of this are relatively easy. They're just a big complicated pendulum. As long as you're staying on the ground, touching exactly at one, at your toe. If your toe comes off the ground, or makes contact with the ground again, as soon as you start considering those possibilities, there's this discontinuity in your state space, in your vector field. Okay, it's like, I have one vector field here, and then I hit the ground, I have a different vector field right next to it. So linearizing doesn't work in those situations. And in fact, we have to do more complicated things to balance it when it's walking than this. But even though that looks like this, the flashy case, that's actually the simple case where it looks more like a linear system and you can balance it. Okay, so <clears throat> I wanna show you one more idea here. But, but are you, do you guys see the intuition? I don't want you to get bogged down in some of the algebra, although I wanted to do some of the, um, the equations here for you to see them. Does the intuition come across? I started off with this, this idea here of we wanted to go from discrete to continuous. We did it um, analytically, but we haven't finished doing it numerically yet, right? So if you wanted to write an algorithm that solved this for the general nonlinear system, we still haven't, I still haven't told you all the, the tricks that were between you know, my graph approximation and the real thing. So I guess, let me do the continuous action version first, and we'll do the state next time. Um, so, I'll start with the dashboard here. In general, I'm faced with taking this minimum over U of potentially very complex things. Okay, but a lot of the robots we care about have enough structure that actually the, the recipe we, I just gave you for LQR is gonna work in the more general nonlinear case. Okay, so so numerical algorithms. to continuous actions. Right, so somehow I have to take this min over u of an arbitrarily complex thing here in a potentially arbitrarily complex dynamics, okay? So there are papers being written, you know, today, now, in the reinforcement learning world, talking about various ways to do this, right? So in general, you can do this. Let's say I've, I've, I've got an approximation to J already, and I just want to execute the controller. You could do a full numerical optimization of this, a nonlinear optimization in general, um, that may or may not succeed. 
you can just try a bunch of U's and take the smallest, okay? But if you're willing to understand a little bit about the physics of our system, then actually you can get away with a much you know, a closed form solution for U almost all the time, right? So my claim is that you'll be pretty happy if you restrict yourself to cost functions that stay quadratic in U. That's really not such a painful proposition in my mind. And remember that I said even in the very first lecture that f of x u for us is often control affine. Right, so this, the cost function you get to pick. That's not, no one gives you that except that's just, you know. If u is a control torque, then it's going to enter my dynamics like this. And so actually, even if j is some big complicated messy thing, it only depends on x. g can be arbitrarily complicated in x, okay? f can be arbitrarily, it can be atlas, right? But if I pop that in there and I try to take the min over u, And the same old tricks that I did before work. This is a positive quadratic function in U, right? So I can take the derivative of the inside, set it equal to zero, and find out that U star, it's a little bit more complicated, but really not that much. The equivalent of B here is now F2. No, sorry, I have to transpose. Um, partial J, partial X. So this recipe of trying to race downhill, given whatever someone comes up with for J, still works when your system is control affine. And if you're willing to just make that one assumption in your, limit, limit yourself in that one way on writing your cost functions. So if you're writing a numerical recipe, then for this kind of system, then you can actually take U away in closed form. Insert that back in. Now, you're still left with, now, with finding J. Remember that the way we represented J in the grid world example, and even in the numerical examples I did before, is it's a finite list of states. So it was just a vector of values for J. To do the continuous version of J, uh, of, you know, to find J for a continuous X, we're going to get into the world of function approximation. So J of X, you know, you, so you'll see approaches on one extreme, which is just a mesh, um, like you would see in a standard partial differential equation numerical recipe, you know, all the way to uh, it's a deep network. And there's something sort of in the middle here, which was popular for a long time. It seems forgotten now, but I don't know. We'll still use it a little bit. Where you can do a lot of stuff, you can save a lot more theoretically, but still have some generality by restricting yourself to linear function approximators. And we'll talk a little bit about that next time. And in fact, what we did numerically, um, in the examples I showed you before was if I started from some initial state here on my q, q dot function and I projected forward my simulation for one step and I landed somewhere between the mesh points that I had on my, on my state space, then I was actually 
interpolating, saying there's, that it was as if I was going a little bit to this state, a little bit to this state, a little bit to this state, as a linear function approximator, which is a mesh is a simple linear function approximator. So I'll tell you some of the details of that, and it's called fitted value duration. <clears throat> cool. I, uh, so I guess I won't see you Tuesday because we have Monday, is it Tuesday? So I'll see you in a week. <laughs>